Hello there, good morning. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Chamberlain Uso. Yes, it's a beautiful Tuesday morning from here in Lagos. I am Kayode Kikilu. And I'm Ayo Makine. Welcome. Malpe, good morning. Good morning from Abuja. I'm Malpe Ogun Yusuf. <laughs> Sometimes I always get pre introduced from Lagos. <laughs> but it's a good thing. And I have the. <laughs> I have the honor and privilege this morning to introduce our first guest, who's also going to be our paper reviewer. Uh, Mr. Igo Akariga is a member of the Guild of Editors. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Good morning, Malpe. Good to be here. Well, I'm, I'm wondering what the papers are saying this morning. Quite a lot has happened in the last 24 hours. And um, if we don't mind, let us start with what the blueprint is saying. Um, well, yes, yesterday was International Women's Day. Yeah, How can absolutely. I forget? Yeah. At International Women's Day, Buhari says any government that neglects women risks failure. Mm. <laughs> Federal government vows to end gender-based violence. Aisha Buhari wants abduction of women, schoolgirls stopped. Help rescue our daughter, Leah Sharibu's parents, right president. 800 police officers' wives widowed in Kaduna. That's according to uh, the CP Commissioner of Police there. APC states endorse 180-day maternity leave for nursing mothers. Mm -hmm. Not a day, what a day to announce, uh, mm -hmm. you know, such a good thing. But what are your thoughts uh, when International Women's Day comes and all the attendant, uh, let's say, celebrations, statements and things of the sort that we see following it? Uh, we're seeing this one on the front page of Blueprint this morning. What are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting that every year uh, the world um, tries to focus on women. Uh, for this year, it is striking for Nigeria as a country. Yesterday, I was uh, following the developments in the media where, um, you know, uh, the, the country was, uh, of course, uh, flagging Ngozi Okonje Weala, who emerged as the WTO uh, uh, president. And then, of course, Amina Mohamed, who is uh, Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. And all. we are trying to put uh, our, women, our best women forward as, as if Nigeria is such an exciting country for women. And of course, the statement from uh, the uh, wife of the president, uh, Aisha Buhari, uh, Twitter yesterday was agog, was very busy with all kinds of opinion. Where is Aisha Buhari, the president's wife? Uh, she was actually uh, speaking against the abduction of women in Nigeria. Mm. I'm sure she's talking about the girls that were abducted in uh, Kasina State and all of that. But again, in where Zamfara. is sorry, in Zamfara states. Mm -hmm. But the issue is, where is she? Why are you writing from Dubai or somewhere? You know, and the, for the president, uh, saying that oh, uh, anybody, any government, uh, which neglects women, risk uh, failure and all of that. Mm -hmm. so it's like we are just uh, one country that likes to mount uh, respect for women. We want the best for women and all of that. In one breath, we want the best for women. In another breath, we are not treating them nicely, particularly our young girls who uh, are the future of uh, women leadership and all of that. Whether in terms of education, healthcare, you know, and all of the issues that have to strengthen womanhood. I do not see the evidence on ground with uh, the Nigerian government that we're actually serious beyond the lip service and beyond uh, the placating press statements just coming out uh, routinely to say that women uh, must be respected and loved that. We must not also forget, because it's this, this president now that is saying that anybody who neglects women runs some kind of risk. Mm. In Germany, uh, in his first term, while he was engaging with An Angela Merkel, the, uh, the German chancellor, uh, the president uh, was uh, quoted as saying that uh, the place of women is actually in the kitchen. Mm. So between then and now, if he's changing his views, that would be interesting. <laughs> well, it's, uh, some people argue that he spoke specifically about his wife. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but his wife is the number one well, woman in Nigeria, really. Oh, well. <laughs> it's exciting. It's interesting how the narratives are changing every time. But mm. it's good. Essentially, every Nigerian must show a lot of must show a lot of interest in the girl child education and uh, you know building capacity for women in Nigeria. If you look at uh, the political sphere, the political parties, for example, why is we say that uh, there is 35 percent affirmation for women? Uh, the House of Reps is looking at a bill to specifically reserve 35% for women participation, in poly, particularly uh, uh, in, the, in the Senate and the House of Representatives. We are yet to see that. 
Uh, maybe under uh, former President uh, Olusegun Obasanjo, we had uh, quite uh, a reasonable uh, share of women in that government. It's and, interesting uh, to note too, that, that when uh, you know when the International Women's Day was approaching, one of the things that we saw was that the president released the list of women in his cabinet and in his government, and people were saying. Hold on, oh. it's only about seven or eight percent. <laughs> eight percent. So when you see that a statement sense. that says any government that neglects women yeah. risks failure, you know, yes. there are big questions to be asked there, especially when we're coming from as much as 35 percent, yes. so to speak. Yes. Uh, we're now at eight percent. Would you it, say that? It, it's sad, really. It, has it's he sad. put his mouth where his money, I mean, money where his mouth is? I don't know how to phrase Absolutely that. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> well, and I think Nigerian women you are said not, so. the, the women. The women are not deceived. Nobody Nobody is deceived anymore. We all now know that uh, yeah. it is one thing to just see this is what we want, but it's another thing to see to see those things down, really. Mm. So women deserve uh, much more, and uh, the government and everyone must put uh, their hands on that to ensure that women uh, get a fair share. You know, the men have tried, but for me, I, I'm, I'm always thinking that in 2023 we should actually be looking at the direction of women. Mm. They, well, perhaps they have more to offer us than the men. Well, I, I. I... If we're to go with what is happening on Abuja Kaduna Express, we don't forget that I think 300 women soldiers so, were yes. deployed there. We haven't heard, we haven't heard exactly. a whimper. That's a good one. You yeah. know, we haven't heard a whimper on right. that road in terms of the you know prevailing insecurity that was there yeah, before absolutely. they were deployed there. But you know, I don't know. What do I know? So clearly, they are doing a good job. <laughs> The evidence of the pudding is in the eating. Isn't, the eating? Isn't yeah. that what they say? Yeah. Well, look at this. Uh, these stories are, are very, very linked. Um, Niger governor talks tough as bandits abduct 30. Mm -hmm. Bella rules out further negotiation to equip vigilantes with pump action guns. Good. That's on page six of the paper. And then you see this. Watch your utterances. Army warns Gumi others. So on page five of the paper. Look, what's going on in Niger state? You know, it would seem that almost on a... I don't want to say on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, we're seeing abductions in that state. Well, uh, it's also, now we, we think it is Niger State. That, yes, Niger State is a component of uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria, but I see this as a general failure of the Nigerian state in dealing with this uh, recurring and malignant issue of insecurity. Mm. Uh, how come we are unable to actually stem this ugly tide, you know? so. Government, uh, some state government are already thinking that uh, they need to equip uh, the vigilantes. Incidentally, I'm a member of the vigilante group. It's a volunteer organization. In where... Niger State? Yeah? yeah no, no, I'm a member of the vigilante group in Nigeria. The national headquarters is in Kaduna. Interesting. Yes, I show a lot of interest in all kinds of things. I want um, some, some form of security stability for our country. That was what drove me to join them. I want to know what they are doing and how they are operating. So I'm, I'm their national spokesman, and I know what happens there. This is a group that uh, has uh, uh, put their lives on the line for over 20 years, and nobody gives them a dime. They are called the civilian GTF in the northern part of Nigeria, and they are just they are about one million well trained, one million resources that is just lying idle across the 36 states of the federation. So I think now that the government is looking at that direction to say they will give them pump action. And uh, that was part of our suggestion. I was in Enugu last week, and uh, Benin, where um, the Inspector General of Police flagged up the launching of uh, community policing and all of that. I was there to witness what, what and these were part of the suggestions, mm. that it is time to, uh, because the police, the entire strength of the police is about 350,000. And then the army itself, the, whether army, air force, navy, all of them, they are already becoming overstretched. Mm. So, and you have the civil defense that is just less than 250,000 that is supposed to uh, protect critical assets and facilities of the country. And this is a country of over 200 million people, for God's sake. How do you put less than 1 million people, whether it's the, 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 the entire armed forces, the police and civil defense, to try and overlook all our security? And you can just see the incapacity here and there. The, the, the men are doing their best, but it's just not enough because we don't have enough boots on the ground in, in places. And these terrorists, and bandits or kidnappers as 
who uh, prefer to call them as it were. They just pick on soft targets mm. because these are ungoverned, unmanned spaces. They just move it down, pick people. Mm. And then the impression is given uh, that the country is not secure. That is affecting our FDI, you must well, know. That's the yeah. spokesperson of the vigilante group <laughs> speaking right there. I think we should also add something to his designation. Gentlemen, what do you think? Let me throw it to Lagos now. Well, let's start with the, <laughs> the Daily Trust first and see, because they have the same headline which he just spoke about. Uh, Niger to arm vigilante with pump action guns, that's what they have here, will not disband groups, Governor Sani Bello. No negotiation with bandits, two brides to be, 17 others kidnapped. Pretty unfortunate, but you know... Uh, Look, from the look of things, one may just as well just go and join this vigilante group. So at least if they give me the pump action, do I get to take it home? You know? who, who knows? But um, and I hope being a member of community policy won't preclude one from being a, a member of the uh, Are you vigilante. Asked? So this pump action gun, sorry, when you suggested it, what, what was it thinking? Are they supposed to what leave it in the offices or they take it out along with them when they go home as well? Well, did you hear his question? No, I didn't, I didn't hear his well, question. I wanted I was... to know about the pump action. I think that Chamberlain is considering joining vigilante because of the pump action. <laughs> he wants to know whether they, leave, bad it, idea, they leave it at home, I mean, in the office, or they can take it home. Well, once you're a vigilante member, you have to be armed 24 hours because mm -hmm. whether you're in your house or anywhere, you know, there can uh, be security challenges where you are expected to rise up to the occasion, you know. So, it is a good thing that Niger State, some states already are using them, you know, you have uh, almost all the Northeast states, uh, they employ the services of vigilante groups. I think it is in the Southwest, Middle Belt, and uh, maybe Southeast. I'm sure that uh, if these gov governors in the respective states uh, resort to the use of vigilantes, that is registered, government recognizes them in the first place. Mm -hmm. you know? and so if they have pump action, and they are already uh, one million, uh, trained men, then I'm sure that uh, all of this insecurity that we have across Nigeria, whether on the highways, you know, uh, will be stamped significantly. The vigilante group is not a frontline security organization. It is, they are just playing complementary role, uh, as it were, playing some kind of complementary role, supporting the police and other security services, whether in terms of uh, intelligence gathering or actually uh, uh, yeah, providing some kind of backup uh, in combat. They are trying to do that, and I'm sure that well, uh, if, in fact, I think that the federal government should look in the direction of uh, the vigilante group of Niger. That will help a lot, and it will also they also they are familiar with all the small small criminal elements in the community, so it is easy to just pick them up, give intelligence to the police or the DSS, and then they can be picked up. They are doing that already, and then just give them some stipends, so mm -hmm. everybody can then go to sleep perhaps with two eyes closed. I, I think it's very important. You know, well, there you go. We so now have to focus. S sounds quite interesting, Iho. I mean, uh, and besides, I don't mind if it's a front line or back line. So whichever way. So if one joins and we all have these pump action guns, guys, I think everybody will respect themselves. So who knows? Not a bad idea, I tell you. Well, uh, while we're trying to find creative <laughs> Thinking ways. Thinking really loud now, really loud. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. insecurity is a big deal. So you understand why there's a need for all those measures, including pump actions and the rest. But, you know, COVID-19 is also another big deal. Well, you might say the vaccine is a pump action for this one, but take a look at another measure that the government is taking. Nigeria to ban flights from UAE, Netherlands. Wow. Uh, that's on page 21. So it, this has been on for a few weeks now. So this is the new thinking, I guess. But in case you're wondering what exactly is going on, page 21 has more details for you on Nigeria News Direct this morning. And, uh, you know, the IWD... Uh, uh, commemoration, you see ICPC saying, choose to challenge corruption to women. So, you know, I mean, the, the theme is choose to challenge, but ICPC is specifically saying, choose to challenge corruption. So, um, I mean, new pointers for women that might be. Uh, it's asking the women to choose to challenge corruption. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's it. How about choose to challenge security? Or insecurity. Well, that's what's happening in Kaduna Abuja well, Express, ch challenging insecurity of women. How about Niger State? What? The women should go to Niger State and challenge insecurity? I didn't say women. Insecurity? I didn't say women. Come on, please. I'm just playing on those, those words. Come okay, let me, let me just take, take his opinion okay. on, on, on this one. Uh, you see, uh, 
Ogun receives 50,000 AstraZeneca vaccine doses. Uh, that's uh, the first state actually to receive uh, vaccines in Nigeria. Uh, I, you know, there's been a lot of talk around uh, why Ogun State? I mean, looking at the population of Ogun State, comparing it to other states, in fact, looking at the COVID-19 cases in Ogun State, comparing it uh, with other states. But I, I think that's that's good news in some sense, seeing that, you know, states are beginning to get ready, in fact, are ready already. But when you see this one, Ogun receives 50,000 AstraZeneca vaccine doses, and you hear the conversation around other states, uh, what do you make of it? receiving its uh, own uh, share of uh, the jabs. But as you uh, rightly noted, Ogun State, uh, the prevalence, the, the, the level of infection in Ogun State, you also know that it is close to that of Lagos because they share common boundary. But who knows, uh, perhaps the, the, the consideration for delivering uh, the jabs to Ogun State. I'm sure more states will have uh, the vaccines uh, as they are being distributed. But whether if you go around all the states at this point, I'm sure nobody knows. Uh, but I would have thought that uh, Lagos State should have uh, the vaccines before Ogun and maybe Kanu, because these are highly populated states. And then uh, the nation's capital, Abuja, where we are speaking from. But Ogun State, yes, it is good. The important thing here is that the vaccines have already been uh, distributed. Uh, but why is the vaccines have been distributed? I do not know if there is sufficient uh, information, uh, education and enlightenment uh, for citizens to take the vaccines because as a journalist I am aware that uh, many Nigerians are still having uh, nursing some fear, some apprehension about the vaccines. If you look at the video, some videos make you uh, on the social media about the needle that is being used. Uh, some people say that these, these, those, these needles uh, are being manipulated. You know, that you put it in the skin, nothing is actually piercing the skin. So there, whole, there's a whole lot of controversy around even uh, the COVID-19 itself. Yes, it is real, uh, but you see the controversies are not also happening. Yesterday, uh, last week I was at a session with uh, uh, the Kogi state governor where he gave, he clearly stated that uh, he, uh, Kogi people will not take any vaccines and that he's not uh, going to take any vaccine himself. That is coming from the governor of the state. So if Ogun State is receiving vaccines at this point and a governor of a state in Nigeria is saying pointedly that uh, he is not going to receive any vaccine and that he's not going to support uh, distribution of vaccines or deployment of vaccines in his state where he has the power to, to enforce that, who knows? That is going to create uh, some uh, complexities and some compound the situation uh, around uh, Nigeria. If some other governors share the views of yeah, Governor Yaya Bello of uh, uh, Kogi State, I'm sure that's going to uh, uh, pose some challenge to the federal government. And the fight against the spread of COVID-19 on its variants, as we are told. Well, um, strong issues there, one might say, but then look at the front page of the leadership newspaper, still talking about the same thing. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination centers not ready three days after flag off. The story is on page four. Portal contacts switched off. FCT residents stranded. States receive COVID-19 vaccines today. Well, that's uh, talking about how the level of preparedness, you know, all kinds of issues around that one right there. But then look at uh, the story right beside uh, the picture you see on the front page. Women's Day. Presidency seeks end to poverty among women as FG moves to create special courts for gender-based violence. Well, these are two strong issues, Igor. Uh, which one of them catches your fancy? Uh, the two, really, but uh, maybe I should take the last one. Uh, the federal government moving to set up special courts to, uh, to hear gender-based uh, uh, cases related to violence against women. Now, six years on, this administration is still talking about uh, we will set up special courts. Is it because uh, yesterday was the, day, was the international day to celebrate women and the government just needed to say something? For me, I would have thought that uh, for any serious-minded uh, government, you would have actually set up the court and say, oh, 
on the day marking uh, the uh, IWD, the International Women, you say, oh, the federal government of Nigeria has since set up special courts to, uh, to try uh, uh, cases of uh, violence against women. And so far, we have convicted so, so, so number of, uh, you know, uh, culprits, culprits. But on that, on the day, uh, six years on, we are still saying uh, we will set up. And that is just the tragedy of, for me, it's my opinion here this morning. It's the tragedy of what has bedeviled the country, where it doesn't seem that there's a clear strategy on how to deal with uh, multifaceted challenges that is afflicting the country. It is just promises that have been made and no concrete actions are taken. And there is no country in the world that can make significant progress when all you do all the time is to uh, just issue statements to say you will do this, you will do that. And nothing really gets done on the ground. Uh, people don't really seem to see anything practically that has been done to address all of these issues that even the government itself talks about. So that leaves the women where, where they are and every, everyone else, every citizen. You know. mm. Let's really look at uh, New Telegraph now. You see the lead story there. Nigeria's security challenges worrisome, uh, says Jonathan. That's uh, the ex-president there. 5,000 Nigerian refugees repatriated from Cameroon. Governors, Buhari will resolve problems facing country, uh, pages 3 and 5. And uh, Kuka, Bishop Kuka, uh, nation's leaders come to power unprepared. Uh, that's what he says. Pages three and five will give all the gist. But um, what are your thoughts, really, on our security situation? Uh, the ex-president says it's worrisome. I must commend uh, Bishop uh, Kuka. He has really been speaking up lately. Uh, you recall that uh, last month, I guess, if you were generated by his homily, Christmas homily, mm -hmm. I think that should be December actually, mm -hmm. his Christmas homily and how the government reacted to it. Mm -hmm. It is not about, we need to see more Nigerians speaking up, right? Now, President, uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan, who hardly wants to uh, speak seriously on issues, you know, he apparently he is just trying to manage the different. Uh, feelings as it relates to insecurity in the country. Trying to be For a statesman. To, yes, trying to that that is the right word. He's trying to be a statesman. But yes, you can you can try to be a statesman. But the realities on ground does not support uh, anyone sitting on the fence at this point or trying to balance the, the you know balance the kind of comments you make so that no feathers you know are ruffled. But now he's clearly saying that he's worried about uh, the, the growing insecurity and every Nigerian as I speak this morning, I'm worried. Because, you know, you can't just uh, put your car on the road and say you are traveling to even to uh, Kogi State here, yeah, which is just, uh, you know, a border state with uh, the, the FCT or Nasrawa State. We all hear daily what happens to people. Or Kaduna, you know, where 300 uh, combat, combat uh, ready where female soldiers have been deployed. So what do we do as a country? For me, it brings, it brings us back to our strategy, security strategy. Yes, the good thing is we now have new service chiefs. They've been decorated with their ranks. But I also know that uh, almost a month after they have been um, appointed, named, mm -hmm. no, no funds were released to them. I don't know if um, between uh, 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 maybe the last three days, maybe the federal government has given them funds. But I also know that uh, these are facts that funds were really not released to them as to fresh funds to say, okay, this is our blueprint on how we want to tackle security. We will need these XYZ funds to deploy in this direction. I know that uh, part of the lamentation, even with the new services in their offices, is that no fresh funds have been uh, you know, uh, given to them. Mm. But maybe now monies have been released, and I think that is just the way to go. Is security is a very serious issue anywhere in the world, and mm. if um, any government who, in, who intends to fight uh, insecurity must take it up as an issue. That is one core, uh, the, the, the question of security is one core promise that uh, President Mohamed Buhari made to Nigerians mm. in 2015, uh, the run-up to the election, mm. when he said that he was going to address very squarely the, the issue of insecurity in the country. But well, six years on, we don't know. <laughs> it's left for Nigerians now to, to take the stocks. We are indeed, journalists, we are, journalists, we are not politicians, indeed. but it is clear. Journalists will continue to write the facts as they are, and it is there yeah. for the people to make up their minds to know, uh, you know, if, if they, and say if they feel safer 
uh, now than they did how many years ago. But we have to thank you always for you know sharing your your points very succinctly on the program. Uh, Mr. Igor Akariga is a member of the Guild of Editors. Thank you so much for coming on Sunrise today. Always this a morning. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, the program continues in a moment. Don't go anywhere. Indeed, that's what we're talking about now, what's going to happen now that we have the vaccines here and distribution has started. What next? I mean, how, what do we need to do to achieve herd immunity? And what are some of the questions that we need to answer from our population on those vaccines? We have with us this morning, Akela Ishaku, who is a virologist and a public health epidemiologist. We have to thank you for coming on Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you, Mayokwe, for having me. Well, you have seen um, the arrival of the vaccines. I'm sure you've watched the progress so far. We saw uh, the first health practitioners receive their shots of the vaccine. And then on Saturday, we saw the president and the vice president. And then yesterday, we saw members of the PTF receive shots of the vaccine as well. And we saw the first state mm. in Nigeria yes. receive its own batch of the vaccines. I think it was Ogun State that received uh, 50,000 doses of the vaccine. Uh, but what are your thoughts now? Because people who are thinking, how, you know, we've been told that health workers will prioritize. They're first on the list, then elderly people, and then people with comorbidities. Mm. Are we on the right track with what we ought to be doing now that the vaccine is here with us? Mm. I think I want to commend the Presidential Tax Force for and uh, National Primary Health Care for drawing that timeline and the strategy being involved in this uh, uh, immunization uh, you know, exercise. Uh, I think we are on the right track because we are leading the talk. Uh, I think I want to commend the President for uh, the Vice President and other members of uh, the Presidential Tax Force for leading the talk and then get vaccinated, you know, uh, openly. And then I've listened to a lot of podcasts being uh, sent via WhatsApp and all the social media platform. Uh, I think we're on the right track. It's just that um, there are a lot of uh, gaps that we need to close. Uh, so we need a robust, sustained stakeholders uh, engagement, stakeholders, continuous communication, and then collaboration. This is quite key. So when I talk about leading the talk uh, beyond uh, the president and members of presidential tax force, uh, you know, uh, publicly being vaccinated, uh, we also need state governors, we also need uh, uh, religious leaders, faith-based organization leaders to actually lead this talk. Maupe, uh, come to think of it that uh, if we have the Sultan of Sokoto taking these uh, shots uh, with some shakes from the north, you know, that will go a long way. Once we have uh, Reverend Father Mike uh, Kuka and on uh, 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 icon, I think, uh, you know, like that. What if uh, we have uh, senators, uh, members of House of Assembly, we have traditional rulers taking this, this. So they need to lead the talk. Uh, uh, it's, about, it's, about, it's about keeping the well-being of, of a nation. And it is this time that we need a national cohesion. We need people to actually lead this, irrespective of our religion's lines, irrespective of even our political party differences. So we expect people to lead this talk. And I think this is what uh, I am expecting as an individual in the coming days. Come to think of it that a vice chancellor of a university takes the vaccine and, you know, all what have you. Come to think that the CMDs of tertiary healthcare uh, institutions, teaching hospitals, and because we prioritize giving specifically to health workers, uh, CMDs of uh, federal medical centers, taking this, this, this. So I think uh, we need a lead to talk. Uh, we, we need to, to lead the talk in this campaign, and I think it's quite key in this direction. You know, you have emphasized the role that leadership needs to play at every level. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, yes, the president and his vice president have led the way, and we've seen, you know, um, other members of uh, Nigeria's leadership, so to speak, you know, leading the way, and you're saying that a lot more on different layers of society need to do that. But there's, there's also the question of saying, yes, much as the need to show leadership, how do we also ensure 
uh, that it does, this doesn't become an elitist thing mm -hmm. in such a way that, oh, the leaders are getting it first before the, maybe the people that truly and will honestly need it. Mm. What are your thoughts in terms of balancing the act? Mm. So I agree with you that we need to balance the act. Um, uh, so those are the things that um, uh, I think there are gaps. I, I made mention earlier that uh, I, I as a person I have seen some gaps and then these gaps needs to, 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 to get closed. Uh, so we need to also balance. So I agree with you that it should not be like uh, something that has to do with the elites but we can also see to how uh, uh, common people within the society can actually take these vaccines. Come to think of it, if we have, um, uh, m uh, you know, market women in, in, in markets taking the vaccines, come to think that we have one or two almageries on the streets, you know, uh, through the amalams and then through a robust advocacy. But they don't qualify just yet, I mean. Uh, yeah. They, they're usually are, quite gone. Yeah, there are almageries that are above 18 years. Yeah, they are still above 18 years. So it's not about the small children you see on the street. There are actually almageries that are even 20, 21, 22, 23 years and above. So we can see to how we can also, you know, engage people like the road transport workers. Uh, they, are, they are unions, we can passengers, you know, boarding at several parks. So those are the strategies that we need to deploy so that mm -hmm. it doesn't look like... Uh, uh, I, 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 have, uh, I did a survey, an online survey, to find out uh, uh, the buy-in of these vaccines, even among health workers and among general uh, population. A lot of people are still hesitant of mm. this. Uh, so we need to break the ranks. Uh, in the, in, you know, among the health workers, it's not about them doubting the science, but it is about the distrust between them and government. A lot of them say that, uh, you know, uh, you did not give us palliative, you did not give us any, uh, you know, hazard allowance. It is vaccines that you want to give us. So actually there is a kind of a disconnect, a distrust. And those are the things that we need to actually work on in terms of uh, rebuilding our national values uh, and reorientation as a country. We need to actually dig deeper. It's not all about uh, COVID-19 vaccines. It's holistically about all facets of our lives as a people and as a nation. So I think uh, the Ministry of um, Communication and Information needs to do a lot. Mm. Uh, private, uh, um, you know, uh, companies, private, uh, they, they should go into public-private partnership. I expect that by now, uh, you know, engage in a robust private partnership with organizations like China TV to drive this process. So I think it is quite key. It's not all about vaccine. There is a major distrust between the Nigeria citizenship and then actually the leadership mm. of this country. Mm. That's a, a lot of work definitely needs to be done in that particular area. You know, I'd like to know a bit more about the survey which you conducted amongst the health practitioners and their you know, hesitancy uh, for the vaccine. I'm just wondering, you know, apart from distrust, what more could be informing it? But, you know, maybe you shed a bit more light on that. I'm wondering, mm. 4 million, just roughly about, I think, 3.9 million doses or so was what arrived in Nigeria. We're expecting a total of 16 million, so to speak. But we know that that will not go around the entire population. Uh, and we also know that this particular brand of vaccines that we have, you need to take two shots of it. Mm. Uh, do you think that we will be on course? As if, you, if we have to name one of these people that we, we need to give vaccines within a period, mm. would you think that we will have enough, you know, to be able to give a second dose on time so that what we have on, on the ground right now will be effective. It, it will not be a waste. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I think we don't have enough vaccines. Uh, Ogun State just took stock of 50,000. And you know, the population of Ogun State is way beyond uh, 2 million, I think 2 point something million. Then a country of uh, uh, more than 200 million having just 4 million vaccines. I think the vaccines are not enough. Um, uh, for us to achieve herd immunity, uh, based on the public health model, you need to achieve, you need to cover 70% of your population. So uh, the vaccines are not enough. If you take the percentage of 40, 4 million to uh, 200 million people, you discover that the percentage is quite insignificant. And I think that time has come that, that the car COVID need to play a critical role in this. We need the likes of Dangote, likes of Bois, likes of Nestle, 
likes of Coca-Cola, this multinational company needs to come. They are not only here for profits. Mm. You need people to be alive <laughs> to buy your products. So I think time has come for them to actually buy in into this and support the process. Um, other countries like South Africa, most of their multinational companies have actually placed a queue uh, in terms of uh, getting these vaccines because uh, vaccines development and delivery is not, is not something that you place order today and you get it next week or in two weeks time. So I was thinking that by now would have have a future plan, uh, what six month, maybe a medium term plan, what six month, one what one year will look like. Uh, by now, we should at the fingertips say that in six months, we need to get hold of a delivery of a vaccine. Do you want to stay specifically where you want to see COVID? Because we understand that even for this four million, they will be helping with logistics, um, with the transport logistics to get it to different states. Absolutely. But it will be quite key that uh, we actually also involve the private sector. I was thinking that... Um, in, in what specifically? Is uh, it in getting a hold or in research and development or what? Absolutely. Also in research and development, also in terms of uh, transportation, even in terms of logistics. Let, let government create an enabling environment for private sector to actually drive. Uh, government, uh, CACOVI doesn't, to me, should have a minimal role even in terms of transportation and logistics. We have great companies in Nigeria that can be able to do that. I was thinking that the CACOVI should have a focus on even how they can support the nation in terms of vaccine supplies and deliveries. Uh, those are my thoughts and my shared sentiments uh, and my naive thoughts. So uh, um, also private sector needs to come into uh, uh, research and development. Maupe, um, people may not be able to, not all people need the second dose, technically. People that are positive for COVID and they recover, they may not necessarily need the second dose. A dose is okay to just boost their immune system. Uh, I think we need to also do a lot. Uh, since this is a rollout program, what I expected for us to do is to place a mechanism through which we can actually see to how many people actually develop immune response to this. So mm. there is no that window. Um, in other spheres of life, once you give a vaccine that is new like this, you roll out, it would have also created an opportunity for us to raise scientific epidemiological data to actually improve on the vaccines. So you give somebody a dose, like a baseline. So first of all, you also need to also screen people to make sure that they are negative before they take it. Mm. But you know, for vaccines, uh, you, you have to do the cost benefit analysis. The vaccines are cheaper than even the test. So, but once you give somebody a vaccine, you need to actually take his sample to check whether his body has actually uh, mounted immune response. After the second dose, you still need to check. So those are pathways that you can also check for vaccine efficacy. Yeah. And I think that that has not actually been put in place. So we need private sector to come in, in terms of research and development, which Let's is quite key. Let's exist the Lagos, and I'm sure my colleagues will have more questions on that. Gentlemen. Well, yeah, we actually do have Dr. Tijani Husseini, who is the technical coordinator of COVID-19 response in Kano. That's where he's joining us from, our studios in Kano. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. Well, there have been previous headlines about um, Kano or Abegban, some states not being ready to receive the vaccine. I think at some point Kano came into the picture. Could you give us a proper picture? What is the situation now? Is Kano ready to receive these vaccines? Uh, yeah, uh, good morning, Chamberlain, and uh, thank you for having me in your program. Uh, yes, Kano is ready, is getting ready to receive the vaccine. Um, we were informed by the National Primary Health Care Development Agency that Kano would receive its own consignment of COVID-19 vaccine uh, today. Uh, we were expected to have it yesterday, but we are going to receive it um, God's willing today. And if you look at our overall preparation now to begin the rollout, we will say we are around 70% ready. And within the next one week, uh, Kano would be ready uh, to begin the uh, vaccination across Kano. And um, again, uh, we have over this period of time um, prepared about 500 and nine facilities uh, 
primary facilities, secondary facilities, tertiary facilities uh, to be sites where vaccination is going to take place. And uh, why it was easy, it is easy for us to begin this rollout uh, successfully, uh, is because of the investment made in uh, immunization services in Kano. Uh, over this period of time, the immunization space in Kano uh, had developed so much that we, we do uh, last mile delivery of vaccines and we are using that same backbone to ensure that um, COVID vaccine reaches uh, the intended target. So what is the rationale behind having 509? How are you going to deploy it? Who are those to come up first for receiving it? Uh, yeah. Yes, um, the strategy actually was to have at least a primary health care, I mean, a facility uh, in each of the 484 wards of Kano, uh, and, and, and again, uh, have additional secondary facilities and tertiary facilities where this vaccination is going to happen. Uh, remember, is um, COVID vaccine is all like polio, where you uh, anybody can give polio vaccine uh, in as much as he can drop the two uh, the two drops of polio. Uh, however for COVID, um, you require health personnel and you require certain infrastructure for us to deliver. And if we look at the uh, space, Kano space, uh, we, we require as many facilities as we can. And because there are strategic equipment needed, uh, that's why we, ha we need to that's, that's why we need to have uh, these 509 facilities, and this is the rationale for, for choosing these facilities. And um, as per the national plan, uh, we intend to start with the frontline health workers uh, over this period of time between now and, and March uh, and April. Uh, we are going to target um, frontline health workers. The, people at the point of entry, uh, uniform personnel, and those who are uh, intimately involved in the COVID-19 response so that we protect them uh, to ensure that uh, they don't get um, COVID vaccine, uh, I mean, COVID infection. Right, so uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, the amount now, we understand Ogun State got 50,000. So I'm imagining maybe Kano might be getting more. Do you have an idea just how many vaccines Kano State is getting today? Yes, um, Karen, we are expected to have um, at least one percent of our population, uh, and so we are expecting around 160,000 doses of COVID vaccine. However, uh, this is only the beginning. Uh, the whole vaccination is going to be in four phases, uh, phase one to phase four, and it is going to be over a period of um, 18, to two, uh, 18 months to two, to two years. Uh, between now and 2022, we are expected to in the whole country uh, to vaccinate about 70 percent of the population and that's around 150 million people and in 2020 2021 uh, the whole country is expected to vaccinate uh, around 85 million people while the remaining uh, 65 million people will be in 2022 uh, so in Kano if you do the computation uh, we, we are expected to to vaccinate about 10 million people and in 2021 about eight nine million people. Now, earlier on when we asked about the rollout uh, plan, you said you're about 70% ready and that vaccination proper will begin in a week. I, I believe I got you right then. But I mean, this is something we have anticipated for weeks, months. We kept thinking, okay, we should get the vaccine. So uh, the thinking for me would be, I mean, hit the ground running, as they always say. So what challenges are you facing really? Uh, how, how hard is it to reach 100%? And why do you have to wait a week before you start the vaccination process itself? Um, the COVID, COVID vaccine itself is a new vaccine, uh, and if you look at the resources required, um, that is, is huge. Uh, although Nigeria is um, also keen into uh, other vaccine facilities, uh, such, as Co, uh, such, such as COVAX and also the Africa um, uh, Union uh, funding mechanism, uh, but the resources required is huge. Uh, 
uh, that uh, really the, the country uh, would require a lot of resources. That might have uh, contributed to us only vaccinating 70%. Uh, and, and remember from the last um, guest, uh, for us to reach herd immunity, we require, we require to vaccinate around 70% of the population. And that is aside um, the logistic issues, um, uh, distributing this vaccine to each and every corner of the country, uh, as well as the um, social mobilization that needs to, to, to happen. Uh, so these are some of the issues that m uh, we are considering and ensure that we've um, uh, reached the right uh, targets. Well, one of the things that comes to me, I mean, you talked about uh, huge resources um, that will be required to take on the task of vaccinating people in Kano. Well, I'm just wondering, you said you have more than 500 uh, vaccination points in uh, Kano State at the moment. I'm wondering how huge is the resources that will be required? What's the budget line like? Uh, because, I mean, I'm just imagining that you need at least three persons per vaccination point at the very least. Uh, so I I'm wondering what's the quantum of resource that Kano is likely to be deploying to get this done? So actually, in each of the vaccination posts, we require five people. Uh, so, so if you do the math, uh, you, you, are, you are talking in thousands um, of people to be deployed. Uh, so the resources required are actually huge. Uh, at the moment, we are thinking of hundreds of millions of Naira because you need to pay for the transportation of the vaccine itself, uh, payment of personnel, incentive, um, resources for community mobilization, and so many other things. So at the moment, we are trying to, we are getting the figures of how much we are going to uh, require to, to do this vaccination. Uh, however, it is going to be in hundreds of billions of Naira. Hundreds of millions of Naira, maybe like two, three hundred million? Uh, around that range. Okay. Now, we have talked about the purpose or the functions that government has to perform. But then there's, there's this assignment of getting the people ready. Government is getting ready. How are the people being prepared? Because you know there is a high level of vaccination, vaccine hesitancy. If we could have uh, hesitancy on the part of people who were to take the polio vaccine at the time, which was so easy to receive, how much more now that it's a lot more complex? On the one hand, people don't like taking vaccines, I mean, taking injections generally. On the other hand, there are those who just have a phobia for needles. So, how are people being prepared to take this on? Um, we are embarking on so many social mobilization activities. Uh, you know, um, people get relaxed. Uh, the vaccine hesitancy reduces when you engage people the more. Uh, when you tell them, when they understand uh, what the issues are, uh, what the benefits of this vaccination is, uh, and what other benefits they can draw um, out of it. And we are currently engaging several key stakeholders uh, to ensure that this message, the benefits, uh, the usefulness of this vaccine is clear to them. And I think we are making progress. Uh, yesterday, His Excellency, the Executive Governor of Kano State himself, uh, had to engage uh, security agencies who are also amongst the first people to get this vaccine. Uh, we had to engage uh, professional associations, uh, health-related professional associations, uh, which also they, they gave us their full support. Uh, now we are currently engaging traditional institutions, really religious leaders, all, all, all uh, key stakeholders uh, to ensure that the message is passed, the message is received, the message is understood. Uh, it is only when we do that, and we are currently on that, uh, that we are going to uh, be successful. And 
from what we have seen uh, and also from the little researches we have made, uh, the vaccine hesitancy in Kano is as not, is not as high as as is Im imagined. Uh, there is a lot a lot um, acceptability uh, on this COVID vaccine. And remember, we had polio experience. Uh, we are going to apply same learning uh, that we had in polio uh, to ensure that we reduce vaccine he hesitancy in Kano. All right, we'll take it from that point when we return in just a moment. Do stay with us. Welcome back. Let's get back to Dr. Husseini. Talking about um, vaccine hesitancy, well, you do know that you spoke about the polio vaccine experience, but that experience too, uh, in 2013, thereabout, you remember that there were some gunmen who had shot some of those vaccinators and then attacked another health facility at that time because they believed that the polio vaccine was going to make people infertile. And so that happened at the time. And then, you know, there was some uh, equal hesitancy in several other parts of the country. So does that then suggest, or are you telling us categorically now that all of those experiences are history, there will be no such thing right now with this COVID vaccination? Yes, unfortunately, in, uh, sometimes, just like you rightly mentioned in 2013, 13, uh, some of our workers were attacked. And um, because of uh, this kind of unfortunate situation, uh, the Kano state government is liaising with all the security agencies to ensure that uh, we provide uh, the necessary personnel with the necessary security cover to ensure that they are not attacked. Uh, there is no such uh, similar incident. However, uh, the best approach of uh, ensuring security is systematic engagement with people so that the people can protect the vaccines. Uh, this is what we are doing currently, ensuring that the people that are going to be vaccinated, they take custody of the vaccine themselves. They ensure they provide adequate security to the vaccine in addition to the formal security architecture. And with that, we feel uh, the vaccines, the health workers are secured enough and there will not be any repeat of such ugly incidents. Right. So I'd just like to understand, you know, the, the workings of this. So we have the MPHCDA, who's primarily responsible uh, for the whole vaccination process. And we have states coming in. I mean, the president did say that, you know, states need to increasingly uh, show responsibility, as it were. So in terms of working together, who is meant to do what? the state and the MPHCD, such that we don't have clashes and all that. So just how are you managing that? Uh, can you repeat that? If you can hear me, I'm trying to understand the workings uh, between the state and the MPHCDA because over time we've heard states say, well, we're going to try to purchase vaccines ourselves, ensure that we protect our people in line or in addition to what the NPHCDA is providing. So for Kano State, how is that working uh, going to work, as it were? How would you ensure that uh, the person responsible for this does this strictly and no lines, no toes are stepped on? Uh, the, the line is a bit very unclear, so... Ironically, I said the line, but we'll try to get, get back to you uh, on that. But let me try this one more time. Uh, if you can hear me, Dr. Husseini, let me just ask, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, thank God. So uh, the question is, how will the workings be between the state and the MPHCDA? Let me just keep it short. Yes, the state uh, is working uh, with MPHCDA um, to ensure that uh, we are su we've successfully rolled out um, the COVID vaccine, vaccine in Kano. And remember, the vaccine itself is coming from MPHCDA. Uh, so we are keen into the national, national um, strategy, national activities, and national program. Uh, so we are working uh, hand in gloves with them uh, to ensure that we deliver these vaccines in Kano uh, successfully. So essentially, MPHCDA is taking the lead here and not the state. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, speaking of uh, strategy, currently there are there are officers in Kano from MPHC Day uh, that are supporting Kano to ensure a successful rollout. Okay. So in terms of who will get the vaccination, it will be decided by the NPHC Day and not the states, right? Uh, in terms of who will get the uh, in terms of who will get the vaccines, that will be decided by the NPHCDA and not the states. Am I right? Uh, yes, the source of the vaccine uh, is from the national government. No, no, the recipients. Uh, so we are getting. I mean, the recipients, yes. not the source. The recipients of the vaccines will that be de determined by the NPHCDA yes. or the state? I, I, I didn't get that. Okay, uh, Dr. Hosseini, I'm asking uh, who will decide who gets the vaccines. Is it the NPHCDA or the Kano state government? Um, if I get you right, um, you are saying the who gets the vaccine? Is yes. The, who decides who gets the vaccine? Yes, the recipients, yes. Yes. Uh, the recipients of the vaccines is actually as outlined uh, by MPHCDA. So, so we are um, uh, following uh, the guidance from MPHCDA. Oh, on a final note, before we toss this back to Abuja, uh, in terms of strategic leadership, would we be seeing uh, Governor Ganduje get the vaccine in public and you know, other government officials? Uh, can you repeat that again? You know, we'll work on the connection. Let's let's just go uh, over to Abuja, where uh, Dr. Shaku is with us, while we try to get this connection uh, clear. Well, uh, Dr. Shaku, there have been uh, you know series of questions uh, as to uh, what happens now that people are receiving the vaccine. This is meant to be phase four, but I mean, people are referring to the fact that this phase one, two, three happened pretty fast. So, what should we be looking out for, really? Those who have taken the vaccines, uh, what? Maybe, I don't know, is it NAVDAC, is it NIPREED? Uh, who should be doing what right now that people are getting those vaccines? Actually, as we, as in the first phase one, as people uh, tend to get the vaccine, uh, the NAVDAC supposed to do like um, uh, a follow-up studies, uh, actually into a research to actually look at uh, uh, adverse effects and adverse reaction as a result of this vaccine administration. And I hope in my thinking that uh, that should be activated by now. Uh, we should have committees in states, adverse reaction uh, committees in states that should be able to monitor this uh, vaccine administration and also report back to the national so that we can have a data on, on uh, NIPRIT is supposed to also conduct um, a lot of research, uh, even NIMA in Lagos is supposed to do what we call uh, vaccine uh, post-vaccination efficacy uh, studies to actually check whether uh, uh, our genetic makeup as black race uh, from Africa, whether we have mounted uh, a lot of immunity to, towards this. Uh, there is an aspect too that we, we don't discuss about that, and I think it is quite key. We need to talk about vaccine injury compensation. Uh, this is what is being discussed in the UK, in the US, and other advanced nations. Uh, what happens to people that get injured at the cost of this exercise? Uh, uh, do we have some sort of insurance cover for them? Are we thinking in that direction? What is the narrative about vaccine injury compensation? Those are aspects that we need to look into. What do you mean by injury? Yeah, so um, there are people that develop um, a lot of uh, adverse reaction uh, uh, as a result of vaccines. Uh, we saw that in the meningococcal vaccines in Kano, where people develop uh, a sort of uh, deformity, sort of uh, associated adverse reaction and adverse effects as a result of the vaccine intake. So, Maupe, what happens? Do we have a compensation plan for them? We understand that a lot of the uh, vaccine companies are seeking 
you know, indemnity. They, 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 do, they do not want a situation whereby they will be sued, mm -hmm. assuming anything should go wrong. Because let's not forget that these are emergency shots. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so so that, that does not stop uh, us from also having our local arrangement, <clears throat> uh, trying to get um, insurance company to come in, uh, <clears throat> private insurance company to come in to actually. So we don't also have these things in-house. So my thinking is that um, um, not a copy and paste approach uh, we should be able to have a sort of a compensation plan, even nationally, state-wise, and lo local government-wise, uh, so that uh, we can be able to see how we can compensate individuals that may have, have adverse uh, reaction and adverse effect. And this will be th without prejudice to the companies who, that Absolute, created the vaccine? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Mm. Just wondering, though, um, when you look at, you know, when you look at hesitancy and you look at the fact that you're also bringing up the sort of, you know, arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's going to make people more hesitant? No, I think it's going to create more confidence uh, in people. Uh, if, because those are the indices that measure safety. <laughs> if you tell somebody that I give you a shot, in fact, we should also be able to tell people that uh, you will develop some sort of uh, high fever because we have different uh, immunological response. There are people that take vaccines immediately, they start sweating, um, you know, the place gets swollen up, uh, they develop fever over time, some even go into vomiting. Uh, those are kind of health education that we should be, most especially among the healthcare workers, we should be educating them. And so when you tell me that, um, no vaccine in, 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 in life is perfect uh, in terms of production, even in terms of immunogenicity. Uh, so we should create a window that uh, if things do not go the way it should be, what happens? That also tends to build in confidence and the buying in. So because uh, if, you, if you tell people that uh, there is a compensation plan, uh, surely in case anything happens, which is done in other places, uh, I think confidence will be built. That's just my shared uh, sentiment. You don't think a dishonesty could creep in as well? And, and not at all. We can move around that and walk around that and to see to that. Uh, yeah, I think if you also, if NADAC will actually also share with the Nigerian population certain results, uh, data they have, or even part of their trial, they should be able to tell us that uh, for every vaccines that you administer, there are some levels of uh, adverse effect and adverse reaction that you get yeah but uh, not for every vaccine i mean we know that if from children uh, the vaccination rounds we do for children there's some of them that have adverse reactions there's some they'll tell you oh don't bathe the child in the evening you know and there's some they'll tell you no this one is you know is okay there's nothing's going to happen so to speak my way this vaccine is not like the oral polio vaccine and other vaccines these are injectables so they come with associated adverse reaction uh, over time. Uh, I think that also opens a window for us to do some research. Uh, there is no end to research. So I am advocating that we leave it open and actually study what are the pre, what are the post uh, immunization, uh, kind of a research that we can't be able to do to actually manage most of these confounders that may actually happen in the future. Let's throw it back to Lagos now. I believe they have uh, more questions for the guest in Kano. Yeah, uh, Dr. Tijani, uh, so perhaps if you heard uh, Dr. Akela about what plans does the state have for those who may have some sort of vaccine injury? Are you thinking about that? Yes, um, certainly. Uh, maybe again to refer back to your first questions. Uh, yes, our governor and other high-profile officials will take the vaccines publicly. Uh, we intend to have a study lunch uh, where um, uh, all the stakeholders, especially to, to, to improve uh, vaccine accept acceptability in Kano and also to reduce the hesitancy, uh, the uh, governor, the deputy governor, and the um, mayor of Kano and other mayors uh, in Kano would take the vaccine publicly. So take him uh, one of your questions uh, that uh, I was lost. Uh, and, and again, 
as per the plan, uh, we also have mounted surveillance for adverse effect following immunization and which we will follow up uh, in conjunction with NAVDAC so that we observe and see what happens. I will also uh, put necessary structures uh, to ensure that people who have um, uh, adverse effect following immunization uh, would be um, identified and get necessary attention. Okay. All right. Uh, we well, do thank you for talking to us this morning. Uh, Dr. Tijani Husseini, Technical Coordinator, COVID-19 Response in Kano. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, Dr. Okiala, a good thing you raised that point because, I mean, everybody, several people kept giving the impression that they all will react the same way. Uh, but we know that these things don't happen like that. People will react differently. And so you never can tell. But let me just get your thoughts on what do you think about the government's decision? Because, I mean, several people talking about it, that if you have not been vaccinated, you cannot travel. Yeah, I think, I think uh, that's, that's a, a quite novel, um, uh, quite novel uh, policy. Uh, this is because... Um, when you look at global health, uh, international travels are also dynamics for transmission of infectious diseases. So uh, those are good policies that uh, it is globally, globally inclined, and I, I think I buy in, into that policy. Uh, it's just that, um, uh, Chamberlain, we need to actually look at uh, how we can be able to make sure that this uh, 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 policy is being enacted uh, properly. Uh, are you aware that uh, if you are traveling uh, to countries in West Africa and you, you needed to have a yellow fever vaccine, uh, they share yellow fever vaccine cards in the plane. <laughs> so we don't know whether people actually take the vaccines or not. Mm. But um, even the pardon me to, tests, uh, I because about this one, week, part, sorry to, to jump in, you know, I in the uh, news last week. Let, let me just add this so you can respond equally as well. You know, uh, when you say, you know, you buy into this, one wonders, the timeline for this vaccination is two years. And at the moment, so what about those who perhaps are 18 or just a little over 18 and then they are in the, of course, very lower phases and they don't get to get that vaccine, they're not in the front lines, and they'll get it much later, and they require travel. Does that mean that they will not be able to travel because they've not been vaccinated? So I agree with you, Chamberlain. Uh, there are international students that travel for their uh, degree programs abroad that they are less than 18 years. Uh, so they need to take the vaccine. And I agree with you that um, let me also say that we also need to open window for private sector to come in, uh, just like the way we did when we are doing COVID testing. And you discover that private labs have been accredited for that. Uh, so in, in the coming uh, uh, days to come, we expect government to roll out policies where uh, private centers can you know, be enlisted to be giving out COVID vaccine. Secondly, um, it is only uh, the Oxford vaccine and uh, the Moderna that people that are, you know, above, uh, less, above 18 years can take. Other vaccines such as Johnson & Johnson are trying to see how they will wrap up their clinical trials so that people below 18 years and pregnant women can also take the vaccines. So it also opens windows for us to go into research. I'm, I'm quite sure that in the coming uh, days and months to come, um, there will be a kind of a review into the protocol for the vaccine administration uh, so that uh, people at all age group can be able to take the vaccines because uh, studies have been completed and then data, we have sufficient data to support uh, the, the policy. So I agree with you that this is going to be a major bottleneck. For example, you have a nursing mother that is supposed to travel with her baby and the baby is even less than a year. Or you have someone that got an admission to study maybe for his bachelor degree outside. Uh, and then he's 16, 17 years. Uh, well, are we going to say that this policy is going to stop them from traveling? So we need to also make the policy flexible. And we need to also generate data to also inform the, the manufacturer of this vaccine so that protocols can be optimized 
and then strategy can be revealed. Okay, because I was just wondering that, that those who also think that we only receive less than 4 million of this vaccine, what if the traveling population triples that? Does it mean that uh, what? When are we receiving the next batch of the vaccines? So, so what happens to those who travel by land to neighboring countries? That's international travel. Will it affect them as well? I don't know. I just but, got a question. Yeah, yeah but uh, while we're talking about that, yes, uh, Doctor, while we're talking about all of that, I mean, perhaps the concern here is, okay, we're waiting for these vaccines to come from outside. And, you know, you would remember that, you know, from the very beginning of our fight against this war, um, we've been talking about some forms of local solutions here and there. I'm just wondering how long does it really have to take? All of the infrastructure that we have locally to produce uh, vaccines and all of that, they seem to be either comatose or just uh, struggling to get back on their feet after so many years. What's the shortfall here? This concern is being raised because we've also heard from various sources that this is not the last pandemic we're going to have. This is not the last outbreak we're going to have. Uh, it, wouldn't it be good for us to begin to prepare now just in case this happens again so we don't wait for a first tranche of vaccines of 4 million for a population of 200 million? Absolutely. Fantastic recommendation from you out there. And I think that that should be the conversation that we should be having now. Um, I was thinking that by now would have had a platform. When, so when I think I've been on this station to talk about local content development in terms of vaccine production. And I was expecting that certain platforms would have been set up by now. For example, uh, now that we are vaccinating 400, um, you know, 4 million, you know, people, I was thinking that in terms of even evaluating the post-vaccination exercise, which is a component of vaccine production, I was expecting that that platform would have been in place. So I agree with you that uh, uh, now would have set certain platforms. Uh, I was here last time and I was sharing with Maupe that we need um, a presidential <coughs> Welcome Home Initiative. Uh, there are classical um, Nigerians. Uh, one thing that God has blessed Nigerian with is the human resources. Uh, people leading uh, vaccine development, not only for COVID, for other vaccines in the world, uh, are, are Nigerians. So uh, in the coming days to come, we expect, uh, by now we should, would have, have a vaccine, uh, you know, a presidential vaccine initiative, even have vaccine ambassadors, uh, people that should key in into this. So I agree with you that by now, would have set up platforms uh, for even local content development. My worry is that um, we have audio policies that are not implemented. Uh, we have things that, uh, you know, take ages. Uh, even a lot of uh, some of my colleagues applied for research grant with CBN. None of them has even gotten a call, uh, you know, like that. A lot of, uh, even have applied for TED fund, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for research grant for COVID. None of them, you know, uh, has, uh, you know. So this opens a window for us to actually, you know, come up with multiple research consortium in terms of vaccine development. So I agree with your recommendations. They are quite valid. By now, we would have also had platforms where we should have post-vaccination uh, efficacy uh, uh, research, uh, you know, in terms of looking at the efficacy of the vaccines. Mm. Indeed, I think that uh, we, we had a conversation with the uh, NAFTA DG and she was talking about how uh, pharmacovigilance is the next phase now. She was talking about a phase four uh, of, this, uh, of the vaccine rollout and she says that she is looking forward uh, to receiving those kinds of reports from amongst Nigerians and she wants everyone to be on the lookout. However, I do not know what, we do, what we're not certain of is whether or not those channels for reportage have been, you know, clearly marked out so that if you have any adverse, you know, reactions from the vaccine, there is a clear map for you to follow to report what it is that you have noticed. Uh, have you heard of any... Yeah, so I, I agree with her that pharmacovigilance um, in pharmacoepidemiology, those are, are studies that you do for post-vaccination uh, uh, exercise. Uh, I've read the protocol, the national protocol uh, for this exercise. I've not seen a place where there is a follow-up for mm. people that, you know, take the vaccine. Um, I was also thinking that um, there also should be a platform 
where people should report adverse. Uh, I think by now we should. So you haven't seen that? I haven't that? seen that. Yeah. I haven't seen that. We should also have that in these centers. Because when I applied online yesterday, I chose the center closer to where I am. And they took me to a primary health care center, which I, 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 I am in the know. Um, and I also got an email and I also got a text message that uh, this is my time between 8 to 10. This is when I'm supposed to take the vaccine. Uh, I will encourage the National Primary Health Care Agency, since they have generated this database and they have a pool of numbers and email address. Once people take this vaccine, we should have a barcode that should flag that someone has taken the vaccine. Then a reminder of possible adverse effects and reactions should follow up through a text message. We can also see to how people can return back even before their second dose in days should in case there are these adverse effects and adverse reactions. So that is, that is quite key. Yes. So um, uh, that, that should also not be saddled in NAFDAQ. We should have an independent uh, vaccine, you know, a, 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 you know, a platform like an institute or like a center by now that should, we should have the pharmacovigilance. They should work in collaboration with NAFDAQ, but independently to see how this can be monitored. Mm. Because NAFDAQ will be overwhelmed with a lot of um, feedbacks that you, they will get. You said you registered yesterday yes. on, online. I registered Do online. you care to share how you went about it? Yeah, so it's, it's yeah, yeah. So you must have a platform that is Android enabled. Uh, so I begin to wonder for people that they don't have Androids. Uh, I want to also uh, encourage uh, 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 the National Primary Health Care to also see to how we can network with a uh, mobile service provider for a quote uh, where uh, I, I have to do for my mom, but I discovered that she doesn't have an email address. She's about 80 years old, so I have to use my email address or do her number, you know, like that. There are also hard to reach areas where people don't even have access to phones. Uh, and Android so those platform. are those are the downsides. No, I was hoping that you could quickly tell us, <laughs> yeah. you know, so what, what website so what, you went yeah, to. Yeah. So what I did was that there was a there was a link. I went through the link and I I log in and they asked me for my full names, which I I I, I, I stated my email address and my phone numbers. Whether I'm a health worker, I said, yes, I'm a health worker. They directed me to my state and local government of residence where I, where I reside, and then I click. Then they asked me the words, and there are centers in words, primary health care, secondary health care, and tertiary health care. Which one do I want? So I just look for a nearby that is less than two kilometers, and I clicked in. And so I got that. Well, if you're looking to register, you, I'm sure you can find the information online, but you can also learn from his experience. We have to thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Early this morning. Mm -hmm. Dr. Akela Ishaku is a virologist, a public health epidemiolo epidemiologist, and he's been speaking with us now, Abuja Studios. Sunrise Early continues in a moment, and we'll have another topic for you. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Yes, uh, turning our focus to Zamfara State and security-related matter. Perhaps you might see some political connection. You never can tell. But we've got two gentlemen uh, joining us this morning. Abdullah Isani Shinkafi, Abga Chieftain. He contested the governorship elections in the state on that platform. We also do have right there Honorable Lawan Liman, who is the APC caretaker chairman for Zamfara State. Both of them joining us from So, Gentlemen, good morning and thank you for joining us today on the program. Good morning. All right. L let me start with you, uh, uh, Mr. Shinkafi. Well, some statements have been credited to you uh, indicating that uh, there are some politicians who are behind the kidnappings in the state and you say uh, they're playing some sort of card. Could you shed some light on what you meant by that? Yeah. And when the schoolgirls were adopted in the early hours of Friday, just a few hours after the adoption of the schoolgirls, one APC chip tent was registered was registered that day as a member a category member of APC. After he 
was registered, there was a serious rally and uh, jubilation when that APC chief tent received his party membership card. Because currently APC are doing revalidation of the membership card. On that day, there was no any sign of sympathy on the part of the APC as a party. After the governor had made a plea, he pleaded that there is no issue of apportioning blame, an issue of party politics or religious differences. All the parties should come to support him to see how this... Uh, uh, girls will be released health and hearty but it's very unfortunate when somebody who is trying to combat or vote in an election and a fourth from Vatican call for holy mass and prayers for release of these innocent girls and somebody residing domicile in Buffalo State, and he's, he's doing a political rally after he collected a, a, a membership card. So that's why we say that a grievous suspicion that something is trying to play out. And from this, those who mediate on the negotiation of the release of the adopted girls. The bandit there in their hideout made mention that on the APC, from strong, pink, uh, strong politician in the first state, have offered them 57 million to sabotage the release of the adopted innocent girls. So it is very unfortunate. And there are some substantial evidence to link them off with it. Because you cannot celebrate when the, when the state is, is, is in sorrow. People are in sorrow. They are in grievous shock. And people are celebrating because they went and took an ordinary membership, party membership. Honorable man, it is the bandit. All right, Honorable Shikafi, just hold bandit. on a minute. Hold on a minute. Let's bring in Honorable man to respond to what you said because you have accused an APC chieftain in the state of being behind what transpired. How do you respond to that, Honorable Lehman? Thank you for, for giving me this, uh, for having me this moment. But, uh, let me see. Which many people in the paranoid. That statement was very clear. As condemned. So for him coming out and making this kind of careless. Why shouldn't you mention the name? If at all he said he knows those. You see, if you go to Zafara, ask anybody, being a child of the most people are using him as a stooge. This kind of He's here, I think that's good. I'm sitting down here and asking. He's a special boy. He's a very slow issue that I'm going to out and I'm going to go out Without it, I don't know just who are behind this. Why should you mention them? Why you mention them? And if you don't, we will take a serious action. Honorable Lehman, uh, your the sound is not too sharp coming. Uh, I mean, listening to you so about either from any of those ends, both ends actually. We'll just check that out and see how we can improve on that. But, uh, Laji Shinkafi, well, part of what we heard, the little, the much we can, uh, or we could hear from him is that you can't make blanket statements about APC chieftain because he says you don't have concrete evidence. 
But in part of, uh, you know, some of what you have equally said out there, you equally said, and a certain APC chieftain too was heard making a call saying that the IGP was not cooperating with them. Could you shed some light as well on that one? Well, it is uh, people around them who have said they have heard one of the APC chieftain was saying IGP is not cooperating with them. It's not cooperating with them. And when he makes a statement, it was reported to the governor, and the governor relayed the information to the securities in the state. So when the security maybe you go into this investigation, maybe they will call out some facts. They will call out some facts because they have did all what they are trying to do to fool down the state. It was a record when one of their members addressed a press conference that they are ready to take law into their hands. They, are, they were trying to, to, to harass and intimidate the former commissioner of police. It is on record we have the video clips, and I wrote a petition to the inspector general of police to in, investigate that threat. So, so do you know this APC chieftain in question? Well, when, when the security go, go uh, swing into investigation, they will call out with people who, are, who, 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 who make such careless statement. Because, because the governor said it was reported to him. Okay. Uh, that one of the APC chieftain was making a call. So that is why we have said the APC should request or the IGP or securities to request for all the prominent politicians phone phones and check their call logs from that 24th to the day these uh, girls were released. They should check their call for uh, phone uh, calls and, and, and get the, what, what they have, what they are, everybody is discussing within that type of uh, time when the girls are in captivity. That's the, that is the naked truth. There's nothing to celebrate. An issue of the security should not be only seen as a para as the only epic center of insecurity. The security in Nigeria is a national phenomenon. There is no exception, no any place except in okay. Nigeria. Okay, just hang on a bit, Elijah Shinkafi. Just hold on a minute. Let, let's try uh, Honorable Lehman and see if we could, uh, uh, you know, get uh, proper uh, some clarity on that. Now, could you go ahead, Honorable Lehman? Yes, please. Can you hear me now clearly? Yes, go ahead. No, as I said earlier, this claim is a careless statement. Uh, I expected uh, Abdullah Shinkafi to mention names. You can't just come in the national TV like this and start accusing that uh, you suspect. Why don't you mention it? This is a serious matter which we have called for several times that this issue should not be society. Because APC being the strongest political party in the past has a serious concern and we have always been advising that this issue should not be put aside. If you have this kind of agenda, you say people who had who had them, why are you there? This I think these are the questions that you even need to ask yourself. But I have said these are the kind of people that who doesn't even allow the, the PDP government in the said are working with in order to cover up their non-performance. The issue of this is, you come out and say, Mr. A, B, C, D, and in fact, I don't even know the way I see this, as if you are able to play with the intelligence of security agencies. Because they should have this intelligence, even before you come out on national TV and start saying, you are accusing the APC. And I said, we are not taking this lightly. And honestly, uh, we will take a serious action against this. And we want you to come out and mention names. We will never be part of this. So, what, what kind of what kind of action are you going to take since you didn't mention names? <laughs> we will take unnecessary actions because if you said an APC members, what does what does that mean? When you, you, say, necessary, when you say necessary action, Honorable Liman, what kind of action would yeah. be necessary then? <laughs> we will take a, 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 an appropriate action that. Uh, 
for this kind of a uh, careless statement coming from somebody who uh, uh, okay uh, uh, start to join me and start uh, to make it well, well, uh, clearly, clearly, Elijah Shinkafi is, is laughing at that statement. So just, 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 just why uh, is that giggle coming from you, Elijah Shinkafi? No, they are, bl they are blindfolded by, by their opposition and their desperation to come back to power in 2023 to cover up their mess. Because it is on record that the APC-led government and session have looted them for a treasury ceiling. It's one of the part of the problem. People have been uh, people have been inject, infected with artificial poverty because of their recklessness. And it is on record. It is only in the first state a immediate past government where a governor will publicly resign as chief security officer and abuse the odd of office and odd allegiance he took as an executive governor. And this governor has gone on to be collecting security board 350 million naira. It is on record on even channel. I saw it where the secretary to the state governor said they spent 35 billion naira on security matters, but there is nothing to write home about. That is very unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. We have the record. We have the record to. To, to substantiate our claims. We have the records. That is very unfortunate. And I'm banditry calling today in what I'm banditry called today is not different with I'm banditry called in, in the last government. And on record, more than 6,500 people were killed under the supervision of the, the former governor of Zanfara State. More than 25,000 people were thrown as opens under their APC leadership. More than 2.8 billion was paid as Samson under their watch. Economic activities have been grounded. Commercial activities have been grounded. Palming, all farmers deserted their farms. Major markets were closed down. People are being discriminatory. More than 6,000 women were rendered without husband as widows. Offense. So this is very unfortunate. This is the government which the governor was sitting on power without fair scholarship with, for without fair work and nipple. So what is he talking about? He's too economical with the truth and he's blindfolded by desperation to come back to power. You know, when the wind blows, we shall when the wind blow, we shall see the annals of the hand. You see, you are just debating the main issue we are discussing now. Get your reporter to get you a video clip of his campaign rally. What he has been saying to even PDP government now he's serving. So he's the kind of person that can say so many things for one thing or the other. We were discussing about an issue of important now. This is an issue of security. You raise an issue. You need to come out and say this and that. These are the person. This is the person. All this you have been... Well, everybody knows you in Zambia. You can say as many things as you want. In Zambia, everybody knows me in Nigeria more than you. No, knows who you are. I know you. I I I I I know you right when we're in the in the in the high school. And when you are in intro in Berlin, I graduated in 1991. You are there as intro student. Oh, don't, don't talk that way. You should mention names. You don't just when the time. I have said it. Go and look the interpret. Go and go and look an interpretation of the former I made. When the winds blow, we shall see the annals of the head. For him, so you can say so many things. Everybody knows you, Zafra. Who are you? You are entitled to an opinion. You are entitled to an opinion. How to say this? Let's put in this question. So that Nigerians can hear you properly. So you don't talk over yourselves. It will be a little muddled up. So can I have both of you speak about the uh, measures taken by the federal government now to see how they can rein in those running riots in the states with the declaration of the no-fly zone? Elijah Shinkafi, will that work? Well, the issue of no-fly zone has no much importance to the state. 
because we don't have even an airport, even a mini airstrip, or a mini airport, the most important thing the Mr. President should tighten his belt and discharge his constitutional mandate as the commander in chief armed forces of the Federal Fall of Nigeria. So the issue of no fly zone has no much effect. What we have, what we are supporting, Mr. President, I support Mr. President executive order, ordering security to shoot any person they found with AK-47. In this type of situation, you have to go into two, bar two double barrel approach. That is carrot and stick approach. Peace accord. When anybody who embraces peace, then the government can grant him amnesty and fight those who refuse to repent. Since this is what's supposed to be, and no, we are in total support of any measures. That is the president. So, president just hold on a minute. And it's okay, just hold on. Honorable Lehman, could you respond briefly before we go to break? Thank you. We, we support it 100%. And uh, in fact, we were surprised and shocked when initially we had the state government were rejecting the no life order. The extent of uh, the state assembly were making a uh, uh, a, a vote of no confidence on the on the on the national security advisor will be because we believe the federal government has what it takes. But what according to the segment is uh, to reorganize the security director and also allow the security agencies to do the needful so that we can get out of this uh uh finance. Uh, All right, gentlemen, just uh, hold on a minute. Don't adjust your systems. We'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, gentlemen, uh, we're just getting your closing thoughts now as we wind down. So, Alajin uh, Kafi, what do you suggest should be done now to ensure uh, peace reigns in Zamfara states moving forward? Mm -hmm. Well, the most important thing is for the Mr. President to the flow of military forces as a commander in chief armed forces of the Republic of Nigeria and to make sure that all form of crime and criminalities should be fought vigorously. <laughs> and also, there should be and a, 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 a time where all the political politicians in the state will be called to sign an accord. Because some of the politicians are, over, are, are overheating the security situation. Anybody will bear me witness. The present administration of Governor Ben Lomatole have reduced the unbanded to the barest minimum level through uh, peace initiative accord. The governor is not the CNC. The APC-led government at the federal is being presided over by Mr. President. And he's not the president of APC, the president of Nigeria. So I charge Mr. President to deploy serious military to make sure that some of this uh, hideout of armed bandits who refuse to embrace peace should be pushed out completely. So, all right, I'll let you have it. So, if, if, if the security agencies were to invite you, having listened to what you said about some politicians, would you give them names? You see, what I have said, there is an egregious allegation. Allegation is a probability. It may be true or it may not be true. And Anybody is entitled to his opinion. People around that APC bigwigs are the people who said they had him in a phone conversation telling somebody, I don't know who they were. His so what I'm saying, I'm ready to make such statement. Nobody, let me make it clear. Because he was saying necessary, nobody can intimidate me. Nobody. And nobody can I cannot be intimidated by anybody. What he was, what the Lima is trying to say, is trying to 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 find my face 
I, it yeah. means he cannot. It means okay, let, let's hear from him. Let's hear from him. Honorable man, go ahead, please. Yeah, what, what, what I'm saying is that we need to be very responsible. This statement you make by saying uh, 56 or 57 million was offered to. I think that that statement is, is very irresponsible statement. That's why I said you need to withdraw that. But you are coming back now to say can, it is I an cannot, allegation. I cannot. I cannot. Let if me you tell you. Now, it is, you it say is this the mediators. It is, it, is the mediators. it is the mediators it who went there to, to mediate with the bandit. They say some people who are for the former government are trying to... You have shown... Let me... You have shown... 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 You, you, cannot, you, are not, you are not even helping the system. Let me tell you, you are not even helping the system because you are shown clearly who you are working for. You are celebrating when, when they do out. Wait, you are, wait, there, advise, was advise, advise, there was a statement. There was a statement. Last week, you are, last week, let me, you are I know, I know. As the chairman of a, a committee, yeah. All right, gentlemen. Gentlemen, we, we need to call it today. We do thank you both, uh, Alaji Abdullah, Hassan Shinkafi, Abga Chief Tain, uh, and then we also have had Honorable Lawal Lehman, who is the APC Ketika Committee Chairman, APC Ketika Committee Chairman, Zam Forest. Gentlemen, thank you for your perspectives this morning. I have, I have an evidence. You are. Well, I guess that's the conversation how. continues. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Oh, yeah. Well, it's been a show. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kyle Kikiolu. I'm Aya Makini. Have a wonderful day. Yeah, so we'll see you back here at 7 a.m. West African time. Have a good one. I'm Chamberlain. What's up? And I'm Maokwe Ogun Yusuf. Do have a lovely day.